The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus went to his hometown, and his disciples accompanied him. With the coming of the Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and most of them were astonished when they heard him. They said, Where did the man get all this? What is this wisdom? that he has been grant that has been granted him and these miracles that are worked through him this is the carpenter surely the son of mary the brother of james and joseph and jude and simon his sisters too are they not here with us and they would not accept him and Jesus said to them, A prophet is only despised in his own country, among his own relations, and in his own house. And he could not, he could work no miracles there, though he cured a few sick people by laying his hands on them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The Gospel of the Lord. God, through the oracle of Ezekiel today, gave us a kind of a reassurance of his abiding presence. He told Ezekiel to go down to the people of Israel, whether they listen or not, let them realize that there is still a prophet speaking to them for a change of hearts. Ezekiel is one of the major prophets who prophesied at a time when the Israelites were in Babylonian captivity. We remembered very well that when they left the land of the Israelites from the mountain Sinai, they started having a kind of covenant promises with God. And in the book of Leviticus, they made a serious promise before they entered into the promised land that they will worship the Lord with all their hearts, with all their minds, with all their power, with all, all their spirits. The Shema Israel. When they got to the promised land, because God has so much blessed them. There was no effort of struggling to, you know, get God's favor. Gradually, they started drifting from the promise they made to the Lord. And if you read your Bible very well, you observe that each moment they go contrary to their promise, God will allow them to be defeated in war. This was going on over and over again until eventually they were taken to Babylonian captivity. God still wants them back to himself. He still wants them to, have to change and come back to himself. Then he sent Ezekiel to preach to them. God also made Ezekiel, you know, to realize that even if they listen or they, not, they don't listen, let him not be weighed down. It is an encouragement in future, a futuristic encouragement. Let him not be weighed down. In case you go there and pre begin to preach them and they don't, they don't, they don't listen, don't just continue to preach to them. One must listen one day. This is to tell us that no matter the state, no matter the level, no matter the situation, no matter the condition in which we are, God still locates us. God still finds us. God still searches for us because he is interested in our well-being. In the second reading, St. Paul was giving account of his life. Maybe in his private moments, he will sleep and begin to remember how he has killed a lot of Christians, how he has shed blood and is tormenting him, and he called it a thorn on his flesh. Probably is weighing that him down. Probably is making him go into emotional torture. Everyone undergoes that. Then in the gospel, Jesus Christ making a kind of pastoral visit to his hometown. His people rejected him. And Jesus, the Bible said he couldn't do so many miracles there because they, he, reject, they, he was rejected. And I want to put up an existential question. Do you think Christ as God did not take the anger so far 
being a God who has compassion, who is merciful, because they rejected him, he failed to give them his blessings and favors and miracles. He left curing only a few people. Are you not thinking God is being angry so much? You may think that, but until you force on your, on your shoe, you will understand. Over and above all these things, the summary of today's message is that one, may we always remember that we are human beings. No one stands before God righteous or should high. We have our free. It is everyone has one or two things bothering him, troubling him spiritually and physically and emotionally. Two, in all these things, may we always remember that God's mercy is ad infinitum. He's always there searching for us with his mercies. Ezekiel preached to the people because God wanted them back to him. He's not preaching to them because they didn't sin, but God wanted them to renounce their old life and face reality and face the future, just like Paul has renounced his old life and faced the future. A lot of people are emotionally down because when they retrospect into their life, they feel like God cannot forgive this life. Devil continue to play this record of their dirty life, their past life, every moment of their life, and they continue to be weighed down. If you are in this situation, the responsorial psalm says, his mercies we search for, and his mercies are always there. In fact, we don't need to search for it. His mercies will always locate us, only if we can open our hearts. A lot of people have gone to confession with a particular incident in their life over and over again, still they don't believe God has forgiven because this particular part of their life continues to torture them. Don't allow Satan, one, to deny you the miracle of God, God's forgiving ability. Two, to tie you down in that particular state of life that God cannot forgive. If God could forgive St. Paul, knowing his life history, what is your sin that he cannot forgive? What is my sin that he cannot forgive? Only if we can say we are sorry. If God can forgive St. Augustine or in all his radical life, challenging life, even shedding blood, killing a son, born for him, what is our own situation that God cannot forgive? If God could forgive David after killing Uriah and marrying her, his, his wife, what is our sin that God cannot forgive? Let that devil be shut up that God's mercy is over, can cleanse no matter how dirty our sins may be. God's mercy overpowers that. That's one message. Going to the gospel, Jesus came his to, to his hometown and they rejected him. I would like you to reflect very well on the beginning of that gospel. When they recognize he is full of wisdom, they say that his teaching was astonishing. Two, from where did he get this wisdom? Two, all this miracle he's doing, how come they have recognized three great things in Jesus Christ which they never had? And the leaders of the moment, if they allow the people to ordinarily notice and acknowledge Christ with all this power, they will become deserted. Surely the people will leave them and follow Christ. So the best option was to cripple him. The best option was to, you know, make him look, belittle him so that people will not leave them and follow Christ. And you see these things playing out in most of our life. In places you walk in, you have the ability, you have the skill, you have everything. But probably one or two persons are not comfortable with your ability. They know you have these skills. You can deliver. But why would you be there? Why would this kid be silent? So the best option is to make that kid meaningless. And that was what they did to Christ. And he couldn't heal them. He couldn't, you know. That was an outborn of over-familiarity. 
knowing the, his family background, knowing his relatives, knowing everything of familiarity, they say, breeds contempt. They were too familiar with Christ that they could not recognize in practical what he has in him. What was, what God gave to him so that they would benefit. I tell you a story. There is a community back home. One person is richly blessed. He has his wealth. He has his money. Another is moderately okay, but is vying to be the king, the king of a community. The other rich man came home, dug a borehole in the community, and told the entire community member to go and fetch water free of charge. Don't pay. The other one who is vying to be a king, uh, you know, fell out with the other rich man and started saying all calumnies, character defamation. He recognized he has his money, but why would he use the money for the good of the people? Why? So that it will be as if he's a bad person. That is a picture of what Christ saw in his hometown. When we have the skills, when we have the gifts, we are not recognized. And Christ couldn't do miracle then. Because most of them, because they knew their family, they knew everything. They didn't listen to him. Over familiarity breeds contempt. And we can always exhibit this rejection of Christ through our over familiarity with him. Example. Because we have no certain prayers all by heart. Somebody is praying. He's pressing phone. Hey, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. He's still pressing phone. Over familiarity. Over familiarity. Grace of God may not quickly come in, in, in such situation. Somebody is praying. Singing. He's also looking at the other person, telling him this way. Over familiarity. God's grace may not easily come. So don't become too over familiar with things of God that you don't pay keen attention to them. Don't become too over familiar with the things of Christ that when you come into the church, you can't differentiate what is, uh, when you are in the church and when you are in the picnic. Don't become too over familiar with things of God that you don't differentiate when you are in the presence of God and when you are in, in the shopping mall. May we always remember that God deserves this respect. He deserves this accolade. He deserves this adoration. No matter how long we have come to him, no matter how familiar we have come with him, probably we are praying, we are receiving revelation. Don't allow devil to make you become so over familiar with Christ that you no longer pay such keen attention. You no longer give him that adoration. You no longer give him that respect. When we do this, we play the role of the Jews who rejected him in his hometown. 